Good rainy afternoon to you all. I'm April Mason and I have the honor of serving as the Provost and Senior Vice President here at Kansas State. And I welcome each and every one of you to the 171st Land and Lecture on Public Affairs. It seems like we've upped that number quite recently with a number of these. Um, we're very, very pleased to build on a rich history of Land and Lectures. The Land and Lectures, if you don't know, started in 1966. Uh, by two giants in Kansas history, the late Governor Alf Landon and the late K-State President James McCain. The goal of the Landon Lectures is to bring prominent thought leaders to Kansas State University to discuss, to discuss pressing issues of the day, and I think you will agree we have done just that this evening. We're very pleased to welcome President Luis Guillermo Solis uh, to the Landon podium to join 170 predecessors in bringing their thoughts, their opinions, and their views of important public issues. Before I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, I'd like to recognize a number of special guests with us this evening. And as I read your name, would you please stand and remain standing, and we'll recognize all of these individuals together. I'd like to introduce Dr. Jackie Hartman, Chair of the Land and Lecture Series and Chief of Staff in the Office of the President. Dr. Barry Flinchbaugh, Chair of the Land and Patrons. Dr. Andy Bennett, President of the Faculty Senate and Professor and Head of the Department of Mathematics. Pam Warren, President of the University Support Staff. The Jessica Van Rankin, K-State Student Body President and a Junior in Political Science. Are you still a junior or are you now a senior? I'm now a senior. Senior in Political Science. Uh, would you join me in recognizing these individuals? <laughs> At this time, I'd like to introduce some distinguished uh, guests that we have joining us this afternoon, and I think the minute I start, you'll know exactly why we have placed these individuals separately. I would like to recognize and have her stand Senator Nancy Kassebaum Baker. There she is. We also have the wonderful pleasure of having with us this evening the Council General, Mrs. Christina Castro. She uh, came to us this afternoon from New York and Mr. Roman Makaya Hayes, Ambassador of Costa Rica for the United States. Would you please stand? <laughs> Both Mr. Hayes and uh, Ms. Castro have traveled with uh, President Solis for the Landon Lecture this evening, and we are very appreciative of them. I would also like to thank Rudolfo Montes de Oca Luco, a prominent Costa Rican businessman and K-State graduate uh, who is very influential in, in confirming our land and lecture speaker this evening. Is he with us? Thank you very much for assisting us. Let me introduce our speaker now. The Honorable Luis Guillermo Solis was elected to the presidency of Costa Rica on May 8, 2014. His political experience includes serving as an official of the Costa Rica's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and as Ambassador of Central American Affairs and Director of Foreign Policy. He studied history at the University of Costa Rica, going on to earn a master's degree in Latin American studies from Tulane University. He was an associate professor uh, of history at the University of Costa Rica from 1981 to 1987. We were just chatting in the back, and I wonder if we might have crossed paths at the University of Costa Rica, because during that period I visited there often with a USAID project. President Solis went, was also a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Michigan from 1983 until 1985. He worked at Florida Atlantic University, where he was a coordinator of the Center for the Administra 
Administration Justice and a researcher at the Latin American and Car Caribbean Center. President Solis has published more than 10 books and written for newspapers and magazines. He will be the second Costa Rican president to be on the Landon stage. He now joins Oscar Arias Sanchez, who spoke here in 1987. Would you please join me in welcoming to the Landon stage, Dr. S uh, president Solis. Good afternoon to all. Thank you very much, Madam Provost, Dr. Barry Flinchball, Professor and Landon, President of Landon Patrons, Dr. Jackie Hartman, Dr. Andy Bennett, Ms. Jessica Van Rankin, Mr. Trenton Kennedy, Ms. Pam Warren, Honorable Ambassador Roman Macaya, Honorable Consul Castro, professors, students, Ladies and gentlemen, friends, first of all, allow me to express my gratitude to this great university for inviting me to share with you some thoughts on state governance and security in Central America. It is indeed a great pleasure for me, but it is also um, a true honor for the Costa Rican president to be here, having been preceded by 171 orators is something that I do treasure very much. And the fact that you're here, even this afternoon, a rainy afternoon in Manhattan, having the pleasure of seeing Senator Casebaum among the audience, and knowing that all of you took your time to come and hear what uh, I can share with you this afternoon is something that I treasure very much, and I want to appreciate greatly all the efforts that you took to bring me here, uh, to keep me well, and to come and share with me this, uh, these thoughts. Uh, actually, I think we, what I'm going to say is shared by most. I'm not going to say too many new things for you all. <clears throat> you know, some of the principles and values that we, we treasure very much. Uh, principles and treasures that, that we treasure because they are intrinsic to democratic development. And I, I refer primarily to the defense of human rights, the preservation and promotion of the uh, rule of law, the construction of societies that put in front of anything else the needs and the well-being of people at the core, at the center of public policy, disarmament, demilitarization as superior objectives like in the, in the search for peace among nations, and the respect for the environment and its sustainable use are as factors that are determinant for the survival of our species. Um, in that sense, I, I really am very pleased to, to be able to talk about some of the problems we're facing in a small region of the world, Central America, so small that all together these six, six nations, seven nations of Central America uh, form a continental mass no larger than Texas, but that's still very important in terms of the a uh, place where it's located and as a bridge between the north, hem northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, between the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. <clears throat> um, well, you've heard I've been a professor for over 35 years. Uh, I'm a historian originally and, and then I studied political science. And uh, when one's a professor for so long, uh, at a lecture like this, I, I necessarily have to talk about theory a little bit. I'm not going to go on for too long, but, uh, but allow me to, to say a couple of things about uh, the theory of the state uh, that I, I used to, to talk with my about with my students. Um, every, every time we talked about security and, and how important it is for societies these days, uh, it's, a common, it's a common question that we face all the time we forget that we have to put that in a, in a broader context. And, and that broader context has to do with the, the notion of security and, and the role the state plays in society and its significance. 
um, especially the relationship among states uh, and their relationship with globalization and the challenges of security that they, they confront. And these challenges uh, we know well. Among others, the displacement of human populations, largely migrations, uh, the growth of organized crime, particularly uh, narco-trafficking, but not only narco-trafficking, we're also talking about uh, the uh, smuggling of people, we're talking about cultural goods, we're talking about our environmental goods that are being trafficked every, everywhere, we're talking about uh, climate change, pandemics, and other similar phenomena which require um, the cooperation among states. These are all problems that we cannot solve by ourselves individually. There's a whole new meaning to the word cooperation in this world of ours. And uh, in all societies, this is the case. This is not a question of the East or the West. It's something that we have to face everywhere in the world. But allow me to uh, talk a little bit about the state and the, the, the role it has played in the, in the structuring of power relations in, 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 the Western, in the Western societies. Not that it didn't happen elsewhere, but I find that it is important to at least refer to the experience of uh, the Atlantic West, those relations as portrayed in the development of, of the state in Europe and in Latin America, uh, the United States and, and this side of the world. Um, if, you, if you recall, in 1651, Thomas Hobbes talked about the state and he called it a Leviathan, a mythological monster. And among the most important, important character, characteristics of that Leviathan, he talked about um, its role, its fundamental role in guaranteeing uh, the social pact by um, ensuring that this state was going to be able to exercise monopolistically, in other words, by in and on itself, the uh, use of force as the basis of security. Security for the state on, in, in itself and the security of the people that, 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 that lived under the rule of that state. And uh, that notion that the state was the only one who could control the use of power to ensure security very soon became the uh, raison d'etre, the, the reason of the existence of the state. And uh, this brought about uh, a certain notion that we could summarize by saying that the, the, the late motif of this Leviathan was uh, that we were going to give that Leviathan absolute power so that he could give us back, it could give us back absolute security. And this was a notion that, that prevailed in the West for you know, at least 200 years. In 1795, Immanuel Kant published his famous book on perpetual peace. And uh, in doing so, he started talking about the need to control the Leviathan. He felt that we had to put some limits to the Leviathan, that we couldn't simply agree that this Leviathan was going to rule us and uh, impose on us its will. And uh, he said, and, and, and this both in the internal sense and in an international sense, he is the originator of what is going to be later considered to be contemporary multilateralism. And, uh, and he basically said, okay, there are a few things we can do to prevent the Leviathan uh, eating us all up. He talked about the elimination of war and the threat of use of force among nations. He talked about uh, the adoption of rules that had to be uh, admitted by all states and that should be enforced by a, a superior organization on all states. And he also talked about the control of armies, and the elimination of secret alliances, among other things. And in, do so, in doing so, he, he proposed the basis, the basis of, uh, of what was going to become later an international order ruled by the Society of Nations first, and then the United Nations, of course. 
But the defeat of Napoleon, well, the appearance of Napoleon Bonaparte first, and then it's his defeat in 1815 and the Conference of Vienna brought about the, the, the idea that the international community, uh, foreign by states, had to put limits to those states that didn't behave well. And, and fundamentally to prevent the appearance of a new Napoleon. So the Conference of Vienna, which actually created the first international system as we know it in the West, was a, 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 a return to the old idea of the Leviathan, although in this case, in talking about the concert of Europe, the Leviathan was going to have several heads, all of which were going to try to con contain the, the threatening presence of, of, of one superpower. Now, whatever uh, we can think about Napoleon and, the, and, and the, the Concert of Nations and the Conference of Vienna and all of that, the truth of the matter is that up until the First World War, that concept of a concert of nations, of an equilibrium amongst several countries to prevent the rise of one, was dominant in all uh, in, 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 in the West. And furthermore, it brought about the question of the state being the main actor in international affairs and in providing the security for its citizens. Now, this changed, and during the Second World War, and after the Second World War, we have the appearance of the United Nations after the failure of the League of Nations, the Society of Nations, as it was also called. And uh, what happened was that the uh, appearance of, of, of nuclear power as a decisive new weapon with the capacity to destroy humanity made the world feel that somehow we had to go back to the old Kantian idea of an international control in individual states. And even when the international order as ruled by the United Nations remained controlled by the five permanent members of, Na of the Security Council, all of which had nuclear capacity, the truth of the matter is that from a legal point of view, from the development of instruments of international law, the world was able to bring forth this idea that there were uh, certain principles that had to be imposed on all the world regardless of if the countries were big and small. One very important piece of that, generated by Eleanor Roosevelt, among others, was the uh, Human Rights Charter, which was agreed upon the nations of the world as the basis upon which the future of peace had to be built upon. Fortunately, that concept has continued to develop. Obviously, the end of the Cold War brought about a new situation in which it was uh, clear that the idea of the emerging threats of the world, uh, again, had to be put in a multilateral framework. It was not the issue of big powers dominating the world, single power dominating the world, even when we had that significant debate on the end of history, you know, and Fukuyama and all of that, the democracy was going to prevail everywhere, even when that did happen. Uh, the growing, the growing uh, sensation in, in the world and then the reality of international relations, particularly with the breaking about of, of, of Eastern Europe and, and the end of the Soviet reign in, in Eastern Europe, etc., meant that, you know, the multilateral vision prevailed. And, uh, the, this latter modernity, as Habermas called it, uh, became an idea that built up on this notion of, of, a, of an open multilateralism uh, that, that, that was uh, so different from that paradigm that Hobbes proposed uh, in the mid-17th century. Uh, and today, uh, this, has, this, this idea of uh, multilateralism and, and globalization has even uh, grown more, furthered by uh, info telecommunications, by the use of, uh, of technology, uh, and uh, due to the fact that we are now challenged by, 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 by uh, threats that were unknown before, not, not unknown in the sense that they were not present, I mean we've had terrorism for thousands of years, but uh, threats that are now capable of destroying societies throughout the world in real time. And this is also the case with natural disasters. So one of the principal characteristics uh, is that, that, that globalization brought about in, in terms of its relations with the state is that 
The fact that now the peoples of the world, not only the states, are present in decision making. And, uh, and this has made some of the old notions that we used to use very complex. Now, meant for many, many years, it was easy to talk about borders as a definitive measure of national sovereignty. Uh, it was very easy to talk about sovereignty in and on itself. You know, the capacity of a state to develop and to exert control over its own institutions, territory, and peoples. Nowadays, some of the challenges I face as a president every day are solved not within Costa Rican borders, but in Brussels, or in New York, and in Washington, or in the World Trade Organization. It's, so the, the concept of what I can do as a sovereign nation is limited. It's at least moderated by these new conditions of the global economy. It is also uh, more difficult to talk about a nation. Look at the difficulties Spain has had. A country formed by several nations. Or Italy, the north and the south, divided by nationalistic issues. Or what happened in the former Yugoslavia. Or what we see in, in Iraq. So, so it's not easy to talk about a nation anymore. How national is a multinational nation? formed with, you know, by hundreds of different peoples coming from different places, particularly at this time of great human migrations. So that's not easy to deal with anymore. So it is a case of non-intervention. Well, we we talk, used to talk about non-intervention as a definitive principle of international law. It was very easy to say, we are in favor of no intervention. And then the Canadians started talking about the right to intervene. What happens if the international community is faced with a, a, a massive violation of human rights and destruction of human life? Do, does the international community, following Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations, has the right, or some say the obligation, to, to intervene? Nowadays, that's even questioning. So. You know, the, the old concepts are, are difficult to deal with these days, and they have become void. This, this complexity have made the challenges of war and peace to become more complex, more difficult to deal with, and obviously have brought up new tensions, new forms of conflictivity that are not the same than the ones we had in the, order, in the old order of, of nation states. Um, and so there's a very fundamental and even contradictory reality these days. You know, the old nation state has to live side by side with these new realities, with these new complicating circumstances, uh, with peoples that are not tolerating the behavior of these states anymore. The Arab Spring is probably a very good uh, example of what, hap of what I mean. No? Populations that say no more, we're not going to take it anymore, and that's that's an old that's an old concept, clearly. I mean, we see it in the French Revolution in 1789. That's what that revolution was all about. Inspired in your own War of Independence in 1776, but it's it now has a different meaning because of the of the conditions of the world, of the geopolitics of the world, and it also has a different. Uh, meaning because of the use of technology and the spread of ideas uh, again on, in, in real time. So uh, it's now we have, we have to, to deal with these new, new circumstances. The capacity to decide has gone away from, from the, Levi the, the Leviathan. And uh, some people talked about postmodernity to refer to all these changes that took place after the uh, end of the Cold War. Um, but it is, it is clearly uh, a, a situation that reflects a new attitude on, on people and also means the resurging of, of what some French historians like uh, Renouvin have called the les le forces profondes, the, the deeper forces of history, religion, nationalism, uh, the language of nations, which are now taking precedence over some of those 
very hard defined, clearly defined concepts that I mentioned. And this is changing the face of the world. Now, in terms of security, the old notion of the Leviathan demanding total power to ensure total security has, has, has flunked. It's not applicable anymore. In fact, one could argue that there is a fundamental contradiction between the new circumstances and the old state. Mainly the fact that even when we are now dealing with democratic leviathons, they are leviathons nevertheless. And that in the ultimate analysis, they behave as such. And that therefore, there is a tension between the tools that states have at hand to ensure uh, security and the demands of the world on the one hand, these new threats that need to, to be a, uh, faced multilaterally or with the cooperation of several states, not only one, and also with respect to the demands of the population that say, listen, remember, I want, I'm here and I'm the sovereign. So it doesn't matter if, you, if we voted for you. It doesn't matter if I, I gave you my reap, the, the capacity to represent me as leader of my nation. I'm still your boss. And whatever I gave you, I can take away from you. And I don't necessarily want to wait for years to do so in the next election. And that circumstance is not a theoretical problem anymore. Look what's going on in Brazil this time. It's a very good example of that. And that can bring in a lot of problems dealing not with the nature of the state anymore, not even with the, legal, the legality of the state, but with its legitimacy, which is even worse. Because here we're dealing with a different a different, altogether different issue, the nature of power as it is exercised by this uh, institution we call the state. So in, in saying this, and I wanted to bring this about because I think we have to, to talk about public security and we have to talk about human security, which is not necessarily the same thing, and we have to talk about the threats that, I, that, are, that, that we face that are multidimensional in the exercise and the use of force. And in doing so, we have to find ways in which to make the action of the state in order to assure security more effective. I mean, how do we do that? I mean, the old recipe was be tough. The new recipe seems to be different from that. I'm going to talk about that in a little, while, in a, in a little, step, in a little while. Um, threats being multidimensional. In other words, the fact that we cannot point at one single reason for a phenomenon such as terrorism, organized crime, and you have a multiple, not multiple factors uh, in the origin of these maladies, of these tremendous, these horrible things, uh, is one problem. Um, but also the fact that in dealing with that, you need, you know, multi-dimensional instruments. It's not the question of the use of force anymore, or only the use of force anymore. And so we're talking here of not only um, structural factors that deal with insecurity, the economy, for example. We're talk we'll, we'll, we are also talking of cultural factors like religion involved. And all of this does have a, uh, an impact on security. And even when we have to be very careful not to criminalize poverty and find a relationship between uh, higher degrees of insecurity uh, associated with bigger uh, degrees of poverty, this is not necessarily the case. For example, uh, take two Central American countries, Nicaragua and Honduras. They're both poor by, you know, UN standards. Yet Honduras is much more violent than Nicaragua. So, you know, there's not, not, not such correlations, not possible. Uh, or you can take a society like Costa Rica that's considered to be uh, a high middle income society, and we like to think of ourselves as a democratic model and all of that. I'm not going to get into 
you know, the niceties of my country, but we are having a very serious problem with organized crime, even when our population is better off than some of the other populations of Central America. So it's very difficult to make correlations between poverty and criminal, and, 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 and criminal activities, illegal, illegal, illegal activities. But there is one that I would like to point at because it's one of those that points at the core of some of the problems we have and, and, and illustrates uh, the multidimensional nature of some of these violent manifestations. If you take statistics relating to young men from 19 to 25 years of age and you correlate that to the use of weapons, the degree of unemployment and them living in uh, very poor, deprived of recreational and economic conditions neighborhoods, then you will find that crime rates are heightened. So th this is a very good case of the kinds of things that we, we, we have to deal with. And in understanding that issue, the other fact that, that has appeared is that Whatever we used to consider legal factors, legal factors of power, are now being challenged by what some people call, myself, factical power. It, it was always there. I mean, these are unduly powerful sectors of society, some of which are even armed, more armed than the legal ones. And this is clearly the case of terrorists, organizations, and this is clearly the case of some organized crime organizations. They have the, the monopoly on the use of force, which hubs so much uh, talked about in the case of states, is no longer the sole duty of the state. The state is being challenged militarily by these universities, by, by these uh, forces. And so now let me turn to Central America, where the, all of this is concocting and what I want is to bring these reflections to the Central American case, which is something that I'm very concerned about and we all should be very concerned about because of how close it is to the United States, because we have a relationship that's very open and because we're seeing new issues arising in, in the region that calls for uh, more attention. And, and I'm glad that uh, the US and the Central American countries are cooperating in order to reduce these threats. On the one hand, We've seen Central America evolve from internal war to uh, a new circumstance. Uh, one of the things that I keep on saying is that it is very unfair to say that Central America is as violent as it was or more violent than, in, than what it was in the 1980s. Senator Kassebaum, who was so instrumental to bring about the peace plan with uh, her colleagues in in the Senate and in the House of Representatives of this country knows that the, na the nature of our violence today is very different from the nature of the violence in the past. In the 1970s and 80s, the Central American Leviathans, with the exception of Costa Rica, which was a democratic nation, were being very, were being, were being terrorist states, were terrorist states that were attacking their own, uh, their own populations. And it took the world and almost a decade of efforts, and billions of Central Americans uh, uh, dead to put an end to that. It was, today, uh, the violence in Central America is associated with the organized crime. It's a completely different issue. Yes, the people are being killed, but the reason for the massacre of, of young people in Central America today is very different from the ones I saw in my own youth. So it's a different issue. But Central America has come out of, the, of, of that stage of its history into a more at least uh, stable political situation in which all countries today have been elected. We have some doubts about you know, this and that country, but they're elected, elected, elected country, elected governments. But the social conditions are still adamant. And, uh, and in, the sen in, in a sense, we haven't been able to solve those structural issues that uh, in many ways justify um, or explain the, the violence in the region. Uh, and the geographical position I've mentioned, it's very important. Central America remains a very sensitive geopolitical region. And in the midst of that region, we have seen organized crime thrive. 
Now, I'd like to mention three characteristics of organized crime as we see it and we, we, we face it in Central America. The first of one is the use of force. And it has become a challenge to na nation states in the region. The, the use of force is immense. Secondly, the capacity to corrupt democratic institutions. It's a very troubling issue because it attacks the legitimacy of the Central American governments. And thirdly, it's its capacity to absorb other forms of regular crime, ordinary crime, and turn that part of their operations. And it comes, organized crime comes in all of its forms. I've mentioned it. Drug trafficking is probably the most common of it, and it's the one we hear about all the time. But there are others, arms trafficking, human trafficking, uh, cultural trafficking, etc. And, uh, and obviously, it has a very serious effect on health issues, uh, in, on political stability, economic growth. It's very expensive. Corruption is very, very expensive and uh, the capacity of, of states to improve the conditions, the general conditions of its population. Uh, now, we've been combating organized crime for you no know, quarter of a century now, 25 years at least, probably more. I mean, the first uh, ex ex exercises took place in the 1970s. Now, massively, we have been investing in this, and the United States has done its part, clearly, for more than, than a quarter century. And, uh, and, 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 and we have not been successful in stopping that, uh, that flow of drugs. Now, the, this flow doesn't originate in Central America. It passes through Central America, from, from basically from the Andean region, and mainly Colombia, in, term, in, in, in what pertains cocaine, and then some other drugs from other countries as, as well. But um, paradoxically, the outcome of peace in Colombia is increasing the amounts of drugs uh, being produced in the country because the government is completely involved in the peace negotiations, which is great. I mean, we are very, very supportive of that process. But in having decided that this is the national priority, the way in which the Colombians were, being, were fighting the war on, on, on drugs, spraying uh, uh, the... the, the uh, plantations of, 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 of coke and, and the other things that they, they did uh, have taken a, a backseat in, in public policy and this is bringing in more, more uh, cocaine into Central America. And we've been being, we, we've been being, we've been pretty uh, successful in dealing with this, largely through joint operations on the sea, the sea line, seafaring, because of, of a way in which cocaine was being transferred. But in doing so, we are now seeing that they're pushing the traffic in, inland. And not, not only that, but the old way of paying with money, the, the, the cocaine that was being brought through Central America has been substituted by paying with drugs. And in doing so, the violence in the streets of Central America have increased significantly. Because now we have smaller lords, war, uh, drug lords that are fighting against each other all the time. So how to deal with this? I mean, some people are t t talking about legalization, for example. I don't think that that's a very good idea myself. Not because we're being successful in dealing with the issue, because we have not. I mean, clearly, the militarization of the fight against drugs has not worked, but simply because the problem is not marijuana. And everybody seems to be willing to legalize marijuana, but the problem is not there. The problem is cocaine. And, and, and not many people want to legalize cocaine. It's a different issue. Okay? Pot, okay. Cocaine, not necessarily. So this is uh, something that, that needs to be, I, I consider that, that I, we have to deal with, and I'm going to close in, with some ideas, we have to deal with this in a different manner. But anyway, uh, the, the situation has been serious in terms of, of narco-trafficking. It has consumed a lot of effort, financial, military, security, human, without uh, real success. Now, there's a second manifestation of organized crime that I would like to, to call your attention to, and that's the situation of migrants. We are seeing Central America now become a bridge 
for migrants, and largely two kinds of migrants. One, one group, which is still there, although we have been able to deal with it in a very humane and constructive way, but it is a significant population, is formed by Cubans who are now capable of leaving their country with a legal passport into Ecuador that receives them. They're now asking for, for visas and things, but, you, but there are over 40,000 Cubans out uh, of Cuba that have been moving towards the United States because they are uh, given special privileges, migration uh, privilege in the United States under certain laws that were enacted during the Cold War. And uh, they want to come here, and if they are able to make it here, they cannot do it directly from Cuba. They have to walk around 8,000 kilometers from Ecuador to the United States walking. Um, if they're able to make it to the border and they touch American soil, then they claim they're Cubans, they show their passport, and they are put into a program, and after a year they're given uh, a residence in the United States, and later on they will be admitted as uh, citizens. And, uh, we had 6,000 of them accumulated at once in Costa Rica just a few months ago. And uh, Panama had the same problem. They came from Ecuador through Colombia into Panama, Costa Rica, and then they were stopped there by the Nicaraguan government. Uh, and uh, it was very difficult to deal with that situation. But at least they had a passport. We know who they were, where they came from, and where they wanted to go. The second group, is what we call extracontinental migrants. These are people who come from Africa and from Asia and from the Middle East. And they're coming following the routes of human traffickers. These individuals who are also part of a, of a cohort of thousands are now traveling through, through Latin America because their way of passage of old is now closed, which was the European route. They wanted to get to Germany, to France, and then they want to come to the United States and Canada. Now this group is again massing up in the Costa Rican Panamanian borders, and they're being stopped by the Nicaraguan government. They're not being allowed to move north. And they're coming, you know, by the hundreds every day. Sometimes 100, 150, 50, you know, and they're coming up, and they're coming up, and they're massing up. And differently from the Cuban migration. This is, a Cuban, uh, this is a migration that we don't know where it comes from. We don't know who they are. They're not identified. They don't bear a passport. And even when we know they're coming to the United States and this is where they want to come, we're not sure they're going to get here. And probably they're going to look for a place to stay along the way. And this um, situation has brought up a whole new circumstance in the region. Uh, we have a situation that needs to be handled from a humanitarian point of view, but there's no way we can do that because one, the states in Central America are not capable of doing this. We don't have the resources necessary to hold populations of 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 people at once. We, this we, we have not seen since the, since the 1980s. And secondly, there's no international framework, neither in Central America nor in Europe, to deal with that kind of new international pro pro problem. This is not being handled. They're not refugees. These are migrants. And in many cases, these are economic migrants, more in the case of, of, uh, of the Cuban crowd than the extracontinental crowd. So in closing, I would have to say that this New circumstances are putting a lot of stress in regional security, particularly when you have these crowds of people who some of them are not even uh, Christians in the sense that they have to receive a special treatment because they have different traditions, religious traditions, which were, in the case of Costa Rica, we're trying to take uh, care of. For example, we're, we bring in the imams from the single, uh, the, the only mosque we have in San Jose to deal with 20% of that population that's, that's Islamic, but who do not have also the, the other traditions, share the traditions, the Latin traditions that the Cuban crowd uh, has. 
So if they, the, the, the whole condition of this migration is very peculiar because, you know, unless, unless we want to create a very serious social issue within the country, we have to let them go. And, and clearly we're doing that. We are allowing them to come into the country. We process them in a detention center. Uh, the law says that we cannot hold them there for more than 30 days because they have committed no crime. They're not criminals. They just went away from their own home countries following the need to, to survive. In some cases, survive from war. In other cases, to survive from hunger. And they're in, in, in Costa Rica. So you know, they, are, they, they cannot be held there. And so we, we free them. And what they do is they find somebody who was willing to take them north. And then we transfer the problem to the next country. And, and, and so they go up. And eventually, they're going to reach the United States. But we don't know who they are. And we don't know who they, where, where they come from. And, and this is a big concern for homeland security. Okay? Because the, these are the new challenges. Okay? So, and this has not been, we, we, the, the Leviathan is not capable of dealing with these issues. So, in trying to find new ways to eliminate these threats, what is the international community doing? And what, ca what can we do about it? And I'm going to close with this. First of all, we have to understand this new, the new conditions of, of, of security threats. Uh, and that these threats are growing. They're not, they're not reducing. They're not being reduced. They're growing. Um, and that, uh, the, the, that the dealing with these new issues is not something that states can do successfully all the time. In other words, we need more than the state. The Leviathan is not working. So this, this entails getting some other members of the community involved. And it is here where civil society, society organized civil society, churches, the private sector, play such an important role. We're calling the attention of, of these groups you know, so that they can become part of the solution. We are very concerned about uh, community workers community work. So we have to get people involved so that they understand the depth of the challenge we face from the states. Um, secondly, we have to deal with the economic realities of these individuals. It is not possible to stop them if they have reasons to leave. And in fact, you know, there is a good case for considering migration a human right What would you have said to your forefathers, the founding fathers of the Republic, when they wanted to leave England because of religious persecution, for example? Was that a right? Should have they been considered illegals, as we call them, because they decided to move away? Or my own experience, my, my family on my mother's side came from Jamaica. My grandmother was, a, my great-grandmother was a black woman with five children from three marriages. She had widowed three times. And, uh, and she came to Costa Rica in the early 20th century. Should have Mary Taylor been held in Jamaica because she, had been, she didn't bear a passport when she came to Costa Rica? It's very complicated. So, you know, ensuring that we do things like complying with the uh, development, sustainable development objectives, which is something that the United Nations is now calling for in its last session, is something that we ought to take very seriously, particularly in places like Africa and the Middle East. The whole question of war needs to be addressed. And probably we need to think about an organization that, just as the uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, will deal with migrants. There's one organization that exists already, the International Migration Organization, IOM, that's not sufficient to deal with the current flows. They're very good bringing mig migrants back to their own home countries, but if the home country is in, in trouble, they're not, they, they're not going back. They don't want to go back, and we cannot force them to go back. So we, we have to think about these things. Pope Francis has been concerned about this um, very much. He helped us quite a bit with the Cuban situation 
and I'm going to see him next week in Rome. And I, I think that one of the things I would like to talk with the Holy Father about is this. What can we do from the, an international point of view to deal with these migrant flows, which are a reality of our time, and they're not going to go away? Um, and, uh, and then the other thing is, if the challengers are multilateral, and if the reason for these challenges uh, is not a single one, that they are multidimensional as well, how can we address that? I mean, let's, let's think more beyond the military solution, which is not going to work. And, and this, again, deals with community networks. It deals with uh, recreational opportunities. It deals with municipal governments getting involved. It's just something very difficult to, to handle in, in, in Central America, where presidentialism in most countries is very, very strong. Um, the deficits in human development and the quality of democracy needs to be addressed. And uh, in social integration and cohesiveness of social institutions, this needs to be put forth, uh, sometimes even before the use of force, which is important. I, I grant you that. You're dealing with a narco organization. You cannot deal with them only in very gentle terms. I mean, there, there has to be capacity of the police force to deal with that. Same thing with terrorism. I mean, I'm not calling for appeasement against the war against terrorism, but I'm saying that there are other things that need to be put in the, in the debate. And, and the, the whole question of justice, how do we deal with uh, the administration of justice and the fact that uh, all the jails in many countries are, are full with people uh, while there are so many others that should be in jail and are not being jailed. I mean, this whole issue is something that I'm, I'm very concerned about as well. But I, I do believe that our role has to be more intense. All of ours, all of us, the role of all of us has to be more intense. And uh, when I come to the United States and I hear the experience that, that you have here with the involvement of people in community fairs, I'm very, very happy. And sometimes I, I like to think that we may get to the, back to, to Latin America with more integrated communities. I would like, and I think that this is a very good idea to deal with crime, especially petty organized crime. The local crime that we're dealing with in, in Central America is as, re, as a result of the new ways in which organized crime pay for the drug and all of that. More integrated societies. Yes, family values, yes, of course, very important. But beyond that, the capacity that we have to join and take over our communities again. And let me share with you in closing one, one, one exercise that we have just started. There's a, a, a barrio, there's a neighborhood, very poor neighborhood in the heart of San Jose called La Carpio. It's a, Carpio is the name of the guy who started this, uh, this barrio. Uh, it was the last name of the guy. And uh, it's one of the poorest uh, neighborhoods in the country. 50% of it is formed by Nicaraguan migrants into Costa Rica, 50% is Costa Rican. And uh, we've had problems with, with, with La Carpio, property rights, uh, problems uh, with people, uh, unemployment, etc. And we decided that we're going to, we're, we were going to change the approach to deal with the situation in the barrio. And instead of putting more policemen in, we decided that we were going to get 26 families of the barrio, in the middle of the barrio, we were going to get 26 families out of there. And we found places for them to be, and they all live in houses that, uh, that do not belong to them. And the, 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 the property is not theirs. The property is public, and they just, uh, they've been there for years. So we gave them a new property somewhere else, and we decided to build a school for La Carpio. School and a high school in that property, in the middle of town, the impact that has had in the community is impressive. I'm not going to say that we are solving all the problems by building that, but the new community spirit, the new purpose that the people of La Carpio have found in having a new, wonderful, beautiful school is something to be uh, analyzed. And I think that maybe 
some kinds of approaches like that, providing music to communities, giving them the possibility of their children to have play, safer places to where to play is part of the solution as well. At any rate, it's going to take a while, but I think if we are devoted and committed to democracy, we will be able to solve some of these issues. And in, in thinking of, of how to close this, 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 uh, these words, these reflections, I, I found a quote by Victor Hugo, the French writer. And he was talking uh, on this particular piece about the future. And he said, well, what does the future mean? And he said, well, it means different things to different people. For the weak, the future is the impossible. For the faint-hearted, the future is the unknown. But for the valiant, the future is an opportunity. I don't know if we are the future or not, but clearly we are responsible for trying to achieve a future for opportunity to all. I thank you very much. President Solis, I thank you for your very uh, challenging and inspiring words. Um, we're going to do questions a little bit differently uh, at the request of the President. Um, people can come forward. We have microphones on the two central aisles, and he's going to uh, listen to the first two or three questions and batch them up and then answer them. So please come to the microphone if you are interested in asking a question, and as you're thinking, um, I have this question to maybe start us off. Um, you talked about sovereignty of nations and how barriers are really changing uh, because we are so interconnected. Is it fair to ask you to look at what's happening with the EU right now and one of those nations wanting to come out and destabilizing the entire unit? I, I really was struck by your words about uh, national sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. Other questions, if you would come forward. Now, you're not a shy and retiring group. I know that. Hi. Uh, I was wondering what you think about um, the amount of personal responsibility a citizen of a country has to stay in that country and improve it. If a Costa Rican citizen should pursue maybe an opportunity for a better life in America or if it's their duty to stay in Costa Rica uh, and improve that country, and uh, just not only Costa Ricans, but a uh, citizen of any country. Thank you. Sure. Um, I don't know how many people here know, but you haven't had a standing army since 1949. You've invested heavily in education. Uh, what are the challenges to maintaining that and maintaining the funding of education and, and other things as you go forward? Sure. Okay, let me address that these three questions and then we do a second round. Well, clearly the, the, uh, the European Union is facing a huge problem um, uh, on the question of integration. They have the most developed integrated model in the world. No region at no point in history has had the level of integration that they've reached other than empires, which obviously are not models of integration but a forceful uh, submission, which is a different thing altogether. Um, it, I think that it is very complicated for, the United, for, for, for Europe to be challenged by, by, well, actually, I think, when is it that the uh, Great Britain is going to, uh, I think they're voting next weekend, mm -hmm. if they stay or not in, in the European Union. Uh, the problem of, of, of integrated systems is that they are as weak as the weakest link in the chain. And so you can have very committed countries that if you have one or two that are failing, then it's not going to work. And the European Union has been moving very fast in, in its integration with a number of very um, 
important agreements, uh, including monetary agreements, uh, Schengen uh, dealing with migrations, uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And now to undo those agreements could have very serious institutional and political consequences. So the only way they can escape from integration is moving forward, in my opinion, not, not going backwards. I mean, if the European Union starts undeveloping, instead of evolving, going backwards to the idea of breaking apart, I fear that the consequences are going to be uh, extremely serious for the system. Because now, you know, the, the larger part of Europe has become integrated in total. I mean, uh, we're talking here of a system where parliamentary discussions are now f forceful, are obligated, um, are, are of, 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 of um, obligatory, um, um, how do you call it, uh, it's um, our mandates that they have to take on the basis of, of, of their own internal laws. So uh, that's, that's my fear. And I, I do hope that uh, Britain will, will, will stay uh, a member of, of the European Union. Now, let me say this, because uh, the position of Costa Rica vis-a-vis -vis the regional Central American integration is very similar to Britain. That's not assured. They could come out. And, uh, and even when uh, the uh, Great Britain is not part of the monetary union, and even when they have, you know, they have kept many of their own, so they're a marginally, uh, uh, a marginal part of the integration system. Their political and economic weight is such that it can have a very serious impact. Um, the second question on personal responsibility, stay or not to stay. My, my experience in dealing with, you know, migrations everywhere um, is that People tend to stay if in, the, in their own countries if they have the opportunity to do so. I mean, if, even if the conditions are not as good in terms of how much money they can make, if, they can, if we can provide the sufficient conditions for them to stay without being threatened and without having problems of hunger and health issues, etc., they will definitely stay. They are not going to go away. Some people go away, obviously, because those who go away are the more, the, the, the more um, aggressive, the, more, the, the people who have more initiative. And if you, if you make, a, if you make a, 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 an analysis of who are the people who go, they are probably the more, the, the more, the more willing to, to be challenged and to, to survive and to move forward. Just think what it takes for a Cuban and we're talking of, a, again, a very specific kind of migrant because they are documented and they, they have conditions uh, of education in Cuba and also uh, con legal conditions if they arrive to the United States. But just think of this. They have to, living in an island that's only 190 miles away from the United States. Because of American law, they have to travel to Ecuador and walk from Ecuador to the United States 8,000 kilometers that's twice the size of the border of the United States with Mexico. They have to, it would be like walking across Mexico to the end of that border and then back. That's as, how much they have to work. So I'm, I'm pretty, pretty uh, clear that if they have the conditions, they don't go. Look what happens with Costa Ricans. Yes, we have, you know, uh, several thousand Costa Ricans abroad. Some of them are here. They've lived in, in in the United States for a number of years, and they're very happy to be here. But, uh, but they have not, but the, but by and far, our migration is a fraction of the migration of other Central American countries. And, and obviously, the, the, the case in point is El Salvador, where several million Salvadorans have traveled to other countries, including Costa Rica, for personal safety reasons and, and economic reasons. And in terms of the army, we, we are in no position to recommend anything to anybody. We, we know that the, the Costa Rican case is uh, pretty exceptional, but it has worked for us. It has worked for us. We have been able to uh, deal with our security challenges with, uh, with the police force and with specialized police units, which are the ones we are now using to com combat narco-trafficking, for example. And most of our 
efforts have been placed in investing in education. The Costa Rican Constitution states that we have to, to, to invest as much as 8% of our GDP in education. And we have been doing this for a while. We're very close to that magical number of 7. Point, we are at 7.89% of our GDP. If we're able to pass a fiscal or fiscal reform, which is what I'm, we're working uh, at at this point, uh, we will be able to get there by the end of my mandate in 2018. But uh, beyond and above and beyond the, of, of that, that number, that magical number, we have been investing in public education for over 150 years. In Costa Rica's first girls' school was created 10 years before we, we became a republic in 1839. And it pays off. I mean, the, the idea of, of a, an educated pop population, even when one can have questions about the quality of that education, as it is the case now. We, we want to en enhance that quite a bit. The truth of the matter is that most of the challenges we've been able to face in terms of the environment, in terms of, of democratic institutions, are closely related to the capacity of the state to invest in education. It's the most powerful tool. I don't have to convince anybody here, I'm sure. It's the most powerful tool a country can use to enhance human development. There's no other. It takes time. It's expensive. As democracy, democracy is expensive as well. But it is essential for human development. That's the experience we've had. And I would not take it away in the sense I would not think about any other possibility, uh, simply because it's, it's a very, very fundamental part of our national being. Let me finish this, an this question, uh, answering this question by sharing an example of this. There's a monument in, uh, in a country of Central America that uh, praises the fighting of soldiers and basically, it's, a, it's a, an effigy of a soldier moving forward with a bayonet, you know, in the field. And the plaque in the bottom of the monument says, in each person of this nationality, a soldier. In each soldier, a hero. This is what it says. And it's, it evokes a war that was fought, you know, a number of years ago. In Costa Rica, we have another monument at the University for Peace, and it basically is a big, two big hands uh, open up, opening up to the sky, and uh, there's a, a dove that, that flies away from the hands. It's a beautiful sculpture that was donated to the University for Peace by a Cuban artist. And the plaque says, uh, or actually mentions that something that a, a Japanese man said about Costa Rica. He said, the, Ryoichi Sasakawa, a, a philanthropist, he said, blessed is the Costa Rican mother who knows at birth that her son will never grow to be a soldier. It's a different concept, okay? And, uh, and believe me, I do treasure very much and I do appreciate very much and I respect very much the military personnel of countries like yours and others who have been willing to give away their lives for democracy and, and, and liberty. And so I, I do not want to, to, to uh, be arrogant or anything and, and, and critical of, of the armed force of any country. That's, again, is a, a, very, a uniquely Costa Rican experience. But it has been useful for us. It has been good for us. And, uh, and I, I, uh, I don't foresee that changing in the, sh in the, in the, in the short term or ever. Other questions that you would like to pose to the President? I am from Costa Rica, and I don't know if most of you know that President Solis represents a third party in our country. He was the first president elected on a third party uh, a few years ago. So knowing that, what has been your um, challenges and opportunities uh, as a president on a country that has been ruled for the main two parties for a long time. Sure. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Um, Mr. President, how do you view American businesses and or entrepreneurs interested in potentially coming to Costa Rica to 
start or grow a business. Do you look favorably on that, or do you prefer to limit it and organically grow your economy? Mm -hmm. sure. Have you seen a strong coordinated response among Central American countries in addressing Zika, or is that kind of addressed independently? Uh, the Zika. The, the, or the, are you talking about the, of the virus, or are you talking about the Central American integration oh, system? the virus. The virus, okay. <laughs> Same word, different wording. One's with a Z, the other one's with an S. Uh, okay, let me address that. Well, you know, it, Costa Rica was very similar to the United States in the sense that we had a bipartisan political system. So it was a bloc that resembled your Republican Party, and there was a bloc that resembled your Democratic Party. Back in 2002, uh, the democratic-like bloc splintered, and out of that splintered came a new party that f in, called the Citizens Action Party that for three consecutive uh, elections lost the elections to the traditional blocs. Okay? Uh, on the fourth election, I came around and, and, and we won the election. So I'm the first non-bipartisan non candidate to win an election in Costa Rica in 60 years. Um, Oh, how sweet it sounds. <laughs> Actually, it was, it was very emotional. I, I, I really have, I, I should not, I, I cannot be bipartisan at this point, but, um, but it, was, it was very interesting. Now, thing is, the whole political structure was created by bipartisanship. So, in dealing with these institutions at a time when people has great expectations of change, I'm dealing with institutions that were meant to function under bipartisan rules and regulations. Some of them are explicit. For example, in the banks and some other what we call autonomous institutions, um, utilities and others, uh, the boards of directors were, were organized so that the winning party would get four members of the board, and the, sec the other party would get three. So we're dealing with this. We, you know, we, don't have a we don't have that anymore, fortunately. But the notion's still there, and it hurts. And so dealing with, with this bipartisanship, which is not bipartisan anymore, is very complicated. Uh, i give you another example. What we're facing a, 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 a great fragmentation in Congress, which reflects the fragmentation of Costa Rican society. And so, in my case, we, I only have 13 deputies out of 57, which is very far away from the majority of 29 and the exceptional majority of 38 that we need to change the laws. So unless we find a way to deal with this, and it is very difficult to negotiate under those conditions because the, the significant blocks are still there. Just think what it would happen in the United States if you would have a ruling president that is not a Republican nor a, a, a Democrat, and Congress with a significant number of representatives that uh, are still Republican and Democrat, Democratic, and then you know a block of, you know, I don't know, a, I don't know, 50 in the House of Representatives and three, four, five senators in the in the House uh, in the Senate representing this guy that was elected upon a different issue. I mean, the 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 clashes, all the circuits that can be broken in that condition. Are very, are very difficult. So what I would like, I, what I like to think of my government is a transitional government, and that the next government will have to continue changing the, some of the things that I, we started. Uh, um, we, we will, we will need, definitely need uh, a state reform and a constitutional reform very soon. We have to move away from presidentialism, for example, to some sort of more parliamentarian-like system, like a European system that would allow us to form majorities in a, in a better fashion. Now, I, I dare say that even with a little uh, trepidation because of the Spanish example. You know. but, but nevertheless, this is how we are approaching it. We, we are uh, continuing to uh, talk with business, with US business, all the time. Uh, not in this occasion. I was lucky enough only to come and visit with you uh, this time. But, uh, I come to the United States at least once a year to, tra to uh, travel around to, s to speak with uh, the private business. We are um, very eager to get uh, investments, uh, direct foreign investment in Costa Rica. We, we have laws and incentives for international companies to come and, and, and invest in different areas. We are now, the mo most of our, 
We have over 250 uh, transnational corporations working in the country, among them some of the largest in uh, the medical device uh, uh, field, for example. We have many others working with Costa Rican uh, um, em em employees in the services area, uh, including tourism, uh, and I've been an adamant defender of the rule of law. Uh, you know, we, we respect contracts, we take very seriously the commitments of the governments that preceded us, even when some of these contracts were lousy, but that's, that's a different question. <laughs> Uh, but if, if the government signs a contract, then we have to respect it. No, we're very U.S. friendly. Um, in fact, tomorrow I'm flying to London for two days of, of visits with, uh, with, uh, with British investors that are interested in coming to Costa Rica. We've just received uh, contracts from Air France and, and British Airways uh, that are going to be flying direct from London and Paris to Costa Rica. Um, so, no, we are very friendly to, to foreign, foreign investment. Um, and then the other one was on, on the Zika question. Uh, we are coordinating a lot on the Zika question. Uh, the thing is, we cannot substitute the local, the local efforts. Um, so far, Costa Rica has only had, I think, a, there is a pro it's growing a lot because of the rainy season now. It's extending because of the rainy season, but uh, we only have 39 confirmed cases of Zika in Costa Rica, and we have several, you know, four or five times that amount in other countries of Central America, Panama including, in including Panama. So, yes, we're coordinating a lot. Uh, the health ministers are meeting all the time, but it's, it's unstoppable unless you have a very um, strong community and public health programs in each country. You can't, you can't do it without that, even if you coordinate regionally. Simply because if we do not control the um, trash and gardens and we don't have the communities working significantly in spraying and doing all, some, some, some things, it's going to go. It's going to move. And one of the problems is that I find is that with the migrants that we're now having in all these countries, they are there and then they move on. And probably we're getting migrants with Zika, uh, contaminated with, with the Zika virus when they come into Costa Rica and they're departing Costa Rica with the Zika virus. So it can become a, a more serious uh, situation than the one we have. And, and clearly Brazil and Colombia are, you know, out, out of the question, there they have hundreds of thousands of people that are sick. Uh, so it, it is a big problem, but we are coordinating very much. Madam, you had a question? Yes, please. And I'll take this three, and I think okay. we should close and let all these good people go and have so, something to, to eat. <laughs> Welcome to K-State. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, um, let's see, in Central America, there have been several indigenous activists and environmental, environmentalists that have been killed. What is the climate in Costa Rica and what um, progress has been made on behalf of indigenous communities? Good. Mr. President, the issue of Africa and the Middle Eastern countries is alignment. What do you think should be collective action of uh, world leaders in resolving immigration and uh, all sort of problems in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have another one if somebody would like to ask anything. I think they got hungry. Oh, no. no, no. <laughs> I was curious about the uh, development of companies that you really can't tie to individual nations anymore with nations that have uh, businesses and I mean, with companies that have businesses in France, America, Japan, China, and how the new development of individual nations treating these uh, entities and overall groups like the United Nations treating these entities? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, we, we have made some progress, but not enough in uh, ensuring the rights of indigenous peoples in Costa Rica uh, for more than... 30 years we've been dealing with this law of indigenous people's autonomy and we have not been able to approve it. And, uh, and the conditions that in which 
the uh, relations between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples in some of the territories in which they live um, is tense. I, I, I'm not happy about this. I must admit that we have tried very, very, very seriously to deal with the issue. Since 1977, we have a, a law that uh, prohibits the presence of non-indigenous peoples within the Indian territories of the country, indigenous territories of the country. But this is not the case. Uh, we have some indigenous territories where we have more popul non-indigenous population than indigenous population. So, uh, and there are 26 of those territories in the country. So we are trying to deal with this creatively and also respectfully because it is also true that in some communities, the indigenous population wants the non-indigenous population to stay, whereas in others, they don't want them to stay, and they want them out of there. And believe me, when, when you have uh, the lack of, of, of land that we have currently, uh, the idea of bringing peasants out of uh, an indigenous territory into nowhere is something that really boggles my mind. I mean, how, how can we do this? It's not a question of giving them a house. These are, these are peasants. I mean, they, they, are, they want a farm. They want to work in the land. It would be like taking any of your uh, producers here and sending them to a small apartment in New York. They wouldn't like that, okay? It's, it's, even if it is in New York. And, and uh, so we, we are dealing with this, uh, and we are bound by international um, treaties to solve this question. Costa Rica forms part of, of a number of them, and we are forced to, to, to do this. And in terms of environmental activists, uh, fortunately we have not had incidents uh, that uh, have created uh, threats to their lives um, as frequently as in other countries. There was a man that, who died a few a couple of years ago after being attacked by uh, apparently narco-traffickers uh, who was working in the beach with turtles and he, he got caught in, or he, he saw the, the narco traffic as they were, and, and they were, they, he was killed. But he was not killed because he was watching turtles. He, it was a, an event that, and, um, and so we haven't had that as much. But uh, no, most of the environmentalists are very active um, fighting the government, and that's quite all right even when I do my best and I feel myself as an environmentalist. In fact, so much so that I won uh, the uh, yearly award for being the enemy of sharks last year, um, which I am not. I mean, I like sharks. Uh, regarding African and Asian immigration, um, yes, you're right. I mean, most of that immigration is associated to economic or, uh, or security issues. I mean, it has to do with the opportunities and it has to do with war, uh, terrorism or just local war. Uh, we've seen that in this case of Africa several times over. And uh, I think most of the world realizes that. And, 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 and Africa is clearly, uh, today is clearly the uh, center of most uh, international attention in terms of, of aid for development. Uh, now clearly the challenges are so immense that, uh, that it's not easy. Now uh, clearly there's a circumstance in the international order that doesn't allow the monies that could uh, go to Africa to go there anymore as it was the case in the 1980s and 90s and that has to do with the economic crisis that a lot of the richer countries in the world have been experiencing. So even the Scandinavian nations that used to be the ones closer to the 1% of the GDP contribution in, in aid to underdeveloped countries are not being able to hold that, that promise. So there is a problem there. But, uh, but you're absolutely right. Unless there is a uh, commitment of the world, which I think again exists, to provide the resources that the lesser developed countries in, in Asia and Africa uh, deserve, there's going to be very difficult it's going to be very difficult to stop some of these migration flows. Now, again, uh, there's the other question, war. And uh, a situation like the Syrian situation is something that, uh, again, affects uh, thousands of peoples who are now moving away from the, that scenario that was under control only a few years ago. And I think the whole idea of intervening in a situation like the Syrian one 
uh, has provided a number of lessons learned to the, uh, to the powers of the world, that maybe we should not do things like that, that, that way. Because sometimes we may have more problems than solutions if we intervene inappropriately. Um, and transnational corporations, you know, that's, the, that's an interesting thing. I mean, that's the rule of the game these days. I mean, uh, globalization has made its way. It's part of the reality we deal with. Uh, the World Trade Organization and other organizations were created precisely to deal with the problem of the transnationalization of everything, of the economy, of everything. And, uh, and that's not going to change. I mean, we cannot go back to the old days where we were isolated from each other. We were just joking this morning with, uh, with the ambassador and, and with the Secret Service friends uh, that have accompanied me during this, this trip that I wish my, my, my cell phone um, got really screwed up and I, they couldn't reach me anymore, you know? <laughs> but that's, that's not going to happen. And so the whole idea is um, of, 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 of the economy not being transnationalized is, is it's not the case. So what we have to do is to you know, agree on rules so that there's more fairness in the way we deal with issues. This is a whole new discussion um, that you probably have it in, in this great state quite often because of the nature of good part of your economy dealing with agriculture and how, how to, and we're having the same debates in Costa Rica. I mean, how to ensure that our local production is adequately, uh, adequately related to the more dynamic sectors of the globalized economy, which in our case uh, has, is something that has been neglected for over 30 years. We only, you know, we kept on thinking of uh, that the only way out for a country like Costa Rica was becoming globalized and, you know, finding uh, foreign investments and, and changing our traditional our traditional exports, which is fine. I mean, we, we agree that this is a good part of the, of the equation. In fact, I always picture this as, a, as an airplane with two engines of which only one is really pushing the air, airplane uh, uh, enough. What we have to do is you know, put the other second engine to work, and that needs to be done in the internal markets and deal with, with agricultural issues and others. But, um, but the old transnational rules that uh, were dominant in the late 19, 1800s, for example. You know, the conditions in which banana companies operated in, in the Caribbean back then, those no longer exist, thank God. I mean, we're, we have other problems. You know, the use of certain pesticides, uh, there are labor issues, but now we have laws and international supervision and people in the United States and in Europe would not buy our pineapple if it's contaminated. And, and there are rules for banana exporters. And, uh, so, you know, things are much better. We, we've moved a long ways from the old, uh, the old uh, traditions of, of transnationalism. But clearly, it's a path that we cannot ignore. Um, I think that that's that. We have kept Dr. Solis, er, Dr. President Solis, I gave you a new degree, <laughs> um, very, very busy today. Um, he had the opportunity to visit with members of our College of Agriculture. He also had the opportunity to meet some of our students and scholars uh, that are studying here from Costa Rica. And just, just to, to make you feel good that there are many people in the audience, if you're one of our students or scholars uh, from Costa Rica, would you stand? Oh, there are several here. Yes. Oh, yes. What a good. I know you had the opportunity to meet many before, but I wanted to be sure you felt Thank very you. much at home. Would you join me in thanking President Solis for his wonderful comments? Thank you.